All right, welcome to Pacific Town Hall. Today is February 8th, 2023. Um, if you're in other parts of the world, it may be the 9th already. Um, we, we run this at 1 a.m. UTC, but it's really tied to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So, um, And it's nice to see people here from Japan and Australia and British Columbia. We kind of span <laughs> all around the Pacific right now, so that's really cool. Um, let me kick this off with a little slide share. Oops. So this is Pacific Town Hall. I'm probably blocking some stuff with these windows. And this happens um, every two weeks on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And just really quickly, Pacific Town Hall is a community-led weekly meetup that happens on alternate Wednesdays. We seek to provide a safe and lively environment for Card the Cardano community to come together and connect, have interesting discussions, and share relevant uh, knowledge at a time that is convenient for people living around the Pacific. Um, yeah, it was born out of just noticing that a lot of Cardano events happen at times that include mostly Europe, and that puts um, these meetings at really awkward times for other parts of the world. As I know Dylan has joined a, a number of different meetings at two or three in the morning his time, so it's nice to have a space to share some time together. Um, and this is a quick blurb. This is hosted by Sonata, which is Salmon Nation Decentralized Alliance. We provide the the Zoom, the meetup, and all the stuff that happens behind the scenes right now. Um, and then just very quickly, today's February 8th. Today's agenda is a quick intro and orientation. And then we have been um, opening it up for some community updates. So if anybody here from the community has anything they want to share to the rest of the group, that's the time to do that. Um, and then we have two planned presentations, um, one from Joe Allen covering regulation as code. Um, she had a funded project um, and she, they're just closing that out. So she wanted to give a public update on that. And then Maddie is here from Socius to talk about the Socius impact lending. And then after the presentation, we'll just open it up for Q&A for either of those or anything else so we can have an open discussion and then we'll close. So the goal of this is to wrap this up in 90 minutes. If we go faster than that, that's cool. Um, but I want to make sure that we let people have their time for the rest of their evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. All right. So also just a a note to get involved. Um, this is a community-led weekly meetup. So if you want to add your ideas and help with the organization and facilitation of this, we have a Discord server right here and you can jump in and um, participate. We also do updates on what we're gonna be doing each week there as well as the meetup group. Um, so very quickly, this is Catalyst. So uh, welcome to the experiment. Things may break, lack documentation, different differ greatly between iterations, disorient, overload, and inspire. But above all, our goal is to provide a safe and lively environment for you to explore the highest potential of human collaboration. We are the Pacific Town Hall, and we're part of a growing community network of town halls, and you can see them all around the world. Um, and these are the times that happen. European Town Hall happens each second. Thursday at 1730 UTC, South Asian Town Hall each second Thursday at 1845 UTC, Eastern Town Hall each second Saturday at 9 UTC, uh, Middle Eastern Town Hall and North Africa Town Hall um, has no set dates yet. So if you're interested in MENA, um, stay tuned. Africa Town Hall ha happens each second Friday at 1600 UTC. Latam Town Hall is each Thursday at 2130 UTC and Pacific Town Hall is each second Thursday at 1 a.m. UTC. Or if you're in the Pacific time zone, it's every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right. And just a shout out to a couple of other um, community gatherings that happen throughout the week. You have Gimba Labs that meets every Tuesdays for their playground at 1800 UTC. Cardano for Climate meets on Wednesdays at 1500 UTC to talk about um, climate related topics and anything social or environmental impact related. 
Swarm sessions happen Saturdays at 1500 UTC and Lido Nation um, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on Twitter at 3.30 AM UTC. They have a Twitter space. So there's a lot of stuff that you can attend and be involved with to keep in touch with the community and what's going on. Um, so again, today's agenda will be community updates after this. Um, and then we'll, if Joe shows up, we can jump into her presentation and then Maddie, um, and then we'll open it up for open discussions after that. All right, I think that's the end of the presentation part. Um, so now we open it up to community shares. So, um, oh, Joe's here. Let me just admit people. All right, welcome, Peter. Welcome, Joe. So this segment, we just kind of open it up. If anybody in the community, probably aside from the two presenters, since you have a little bit of a longer thing, um, if you just want to share what's going on, what you're up to, um, now's the time. So I know there's a number of projects here from Landano, Orcfax, Algae Token. Um, Joe has a bunch of stuff going on. Do you guys want to give any updates that you want to share with who's here? Go, but I came to talk a lot, so I'll wait. I'll wait patiently if somebody else says. Um, why don't you just jump in there, Peter? All right, then. In the absence of anybody else, here I go. So, um, yeah, I just got back from Miami last week, where I was invited to speak at Quantum Miami, quite a large, about two thousand people crypto conference. I think I was the only Cardano project represented there. Um, got fifty minutes on the main stage. Um, used it to like tout um the two projects that I've founded, uh, Landano Land Land Right Records on our Cardano blockchain, and Orgfax, a Cardano native oracle. Um, that's going to be introduced very soon to the Cardano DeFi space. And then I used it to also like trumpet um Cardano itself. So you know, like why would I build on Cardano? Um, I actually wrote it. I think what I think is a half decent little blog post about that. Thirty reasons from the Masari report. Um, so if you Google, uh, why Cardano in 2023, Peter Van Garder, and you'll find that. Um, and if you go to my, um, Twitter handle or LinkedIn, there's a link right now to that, uh, 15 minute YouTube presentation. If you're interested. Um, the reason I went there, the main reason I went there is that Landano is, um, you know, thanks to the catalyst front end debacle, whatever you take away from that, um, kind of forced the issue, uh, on us to like, look outside of Catalyst and Cardano for our next round of funding for Landano. Um, and which means that we're going to BC route with Landano. Um, and so, yeah, we're in the process now of like, we're in an accelerator um, and in entering our seed round. And essentially we're just, just as of today, we finished the polish off the first proper investor pitch deck. Um, and so we're asking for two million seed round. Um, and that's to finish off our MVP and essentially aggressively enter the Ghana market where we've been doing our pilots and having really positive results and really positive market analysis is a huge business opportunity for us there. So we're excited about that. And on the OrgFact side of things, um, I think, you know, given my expertise in digital archives and record keeping, I've approached the Oracle problem from that perspective and I've designed a digital archive system that happens to also publish essentially data on chain as an Oracle. And I think that comprehensive approach is actually revolutionary in the entire Oracle space. I think it's much better than what Chainlink's offering on Ethereum and other chains and, and other competitors' offerings. Um, we're open sourcing the actual publication to, as the Cardano Open Oracle protocol. So other projects, if they want to run their own Oracles, or they, you know, ideally, of course, we would like them to come to us. We've got a very exciting tokenomics model coming out for as part of an ISPO that we'll launch. So that's essentially the, the next way to fund the OrgFax work is we're going to do it through an ISPO. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really exciting tokenomics model that we're uh, working on with Simon Peters from Zerberos, who's, I, I would say, is probably the foremost tokenomics expert in our Cardano space. Um, their main business is essentially risk management and token analysis and keeping um, founders honest about uh, the tokenomics they published. And um, so we've really benefited from his input. And um, I think we put together a really uh, sustainable financial model on top of what I think is a superior technical architecture. So of course, I'm going to say that on the founder, but um, I think we're going to be able to prove it. So yeah, that's what's happening in my world. Um, I'm based in Vancouver, Canada, for people that haven't met me yet. So across the, across the water from Nori and Brian and who else is here. 
I think Jeremy's here. Yeah, for, you, get, you guys from Victoria. Um, so yeah, if you have any, you know, hit me up later in DM if you have any questions about anything like that. But I mean, that's kind of an update on the work I've been doing. And, and of course, both Landano and Orgfax got their start as Project Catalyst project, uh, projects. That they, they wouldn't exist quite honestly without the opportunity we got to get that Catalyst pre-seed funding and get this off the ground. Nobody would have taken a flyer on what we were proposing to do. But now, in fact, we have, you know, very, I think, very interesting uh, business opportunities in front of us for investors. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, any other updates before we jump into the presentations from Joe and Maddie? Yeah, I could I could talk a little bit. So we've we've also sort of working from funded um, catalyst and trying to get through the uh, the challenge setting through Carter shifts a little different to the native one. So there's been a couple of sort of uh, roadblocks and changes needed to be made, but that's a different story. I mean, uh, that's something Sarah would also be aware of, which has made things a little difficult, but um, it's also uh, made us focus on a few other things that I think are very exciting. So we've got some projects we're working on that are pretty exciting and um, I can't wait to really share it. But at the moment, it's it's there's a couple of things so different that we want to keep it under wraps because uh, we sort of want to blow people's minds with this crazy idea. <laughs> and um, yeah, we've been, you know, trying to get through what we can. Um, so yeah, I mean, later I'd, I'd like to speak to you again, Sarah, when you've got time. Um, I, I traveled around a bit for Christmas meeting up with people. So that was excellent meeting people from the real fire community uh, and things like that. Um, all around the world so it was really good to meet up with people in person um, it's good to to sort of collaborate and get new ideas so yeah that was excellent awesome we look forward to hearing what the the new thing is <laughs> I'm really excited to hear about that Pete did you want to add anything yeah yeah, I've got a quick update for um, our uh, Catalyst uh, proposals as well. So we we got three in on nine around uh, the Cardano Press uh, plugin that we're building for uh, the Cardano ecosystem. So it allows you to connect uh, your existing WordPress website with the Cardano blockchain with the plugin. And it does uh, a whole lot of different um, use cases from NFT gating to delegation and all sorts of things that you can think about uh, combining those mechanisms with We've just finished uh, all of our three proposals uh, three weeks ago. We managed to get them listed in the WordPress plugin directory, and we're getting a lot more exposure and growth through that platform now, uh, which has been absolutely fantastic. So uh, just uh, because it's a, it's a developer tool, uh, um, a builder's tool, we've just got under 100 installs, unique installs of different um, uh, builders at the moment. So I'm quite happy with that uh, amount of growth over the last few weeks. Um, and now we're looking at launching our own NFT project, which will showcase the entire ecosystem, everything from the ISPO dashboard that we built, the NFT content gating and everything else around it. So we're building um, a, a full NFT um, collection that will showcase exactly what the um, um, plugin and what WordPress can do. So uh, hopefully users can um, see its potential, use its um, uh in the various use cases that we put together and uh, really get behind the project. So that's where we're at the moment. And hopefully that NFT project uh, funds the next round of development to build uh, the SaaS platform behind it to make it even easier for projects to launch um, an NFT website for their project or uh, whatever they want to build or a stake pool website, whatever it is. So it's a quick, easy solution for anyone that wants to um, build a DAP connected website to the Katana blockchain. Nice. All right. Thanks for that update, Pete. Um, and then I just want to call Saurabh onto the floor. He's new to Pacific Town Hall, but he's here um, new in the Cardano community and doing a project called Color the Blockchain. Do you want to give a little two-minute intro to what you're doing, Saurabh? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Appreciate the space. Sorry for showing up late. I was trying to get... I'm new to Meetup too, so I was so confused that I got the link. But um, yeah, so my name's Saurabh. Uh, I'm the co-founder of something called Color the Blockchain. It's an initiative that was response-based. Um, and the reason we built it was we faced a lot of 
we witnessed a lot of racism and sexism directly that uh, that hurt us and people around us in 2020 within the Web3 space. And I realized quickly coming to the space with tourist eyes that we're still human beings and we have a lot of unlearning to do. Although this technology is beautiful, powerful and empowering, it's still up to us to still acknowledge the fact that every morning isn't a good morning and every moment isn't the happiest moment we have we can make it that you know what i mean so our goal was to call it the blockchain and how we're doing that is by providing people equal access into web3 by providing them basic um resources such as computers internet cards and um education delivered in the cadence of pop culture and we do this because um the when i say cadence of pop culture what i mean by that is using a language that is not that foreign using a language that is more common um, and breaking down the terms, you know, rather than using the DeFi terms, just breaking down the terms for, for people to understand using everyday language. And that's our goal. Um, we have a few pieces of uh, um, proof of work from before. However, our current, we gave someone in India a computer named Odinson. Um, there's a lot more I could explain, but you can go to color the blockchain.org and then learn more about it if you have time or contact me. But currently we're, our goal is to raise five computers and to bring it to an indigenous community in, in Canada with their consent, of course, if that's what they want and show them this technology. You know? So color the blockchain.org and just contact me. I'd love to build with people. Beautiful. Yeah. And everybody that gave updates, if you want to drop links or contact things in the chat, I'll add that to um the the write-up when we post this video so rob i saw the um uh color the blockchain nft the other day and i minted it and i uh, also reached out to you guys for uh, an interview too so I, I think it's awesome what you guys are doing oh yeah that was you amazing thank you so much i was just about to message you <laughs> oh good thank you so much pete does the best interviews in our space so you definitely want to get on my show yeah um oh, can i ask you a quick question so um um, so for Landano, part of what we're exploring, so what we're doing is we're going to rural villages in sub-Saharan Africa. We're working in uh, Ghana, Mozambique, Kenya next year. And so uh, obviously one of the things we discover is that obviously this, we have to meet our users where they're at. So, which means a lot of literate users, like just the literate writing wise, but also technology literate. And then also obviously like, you know, you can't assume that everybody in these rural villages is going to own a smartphone. So we discovered very, we're partnering with World Mobile um, to uh, basically drop them a pen in every village we go into. And then at the same time, our strategy is just to buy five cheap Chromebooks uh, per village and go, there you go. Now you can now you can use Landano. And by the way, you've got your internet and you've got computers. So, uh, and we just see, we just, for us, it's just a lost leader so that we can get these people on our land rights platform because that's, you know, again, that's the end goal. Well, that the end goal is to get their get them proper land tenure with good standards compliant records that meet all the legal requirements and then use that to get uh, entered uh, introduced into DeFi lending so anyway long story the point is um we haven't really gotten much further other than like kind of shopping around a little bit trying to price out like what a chromebook would cost is that when we just kind of you know chromebooks are not ideal it's not like I've, i got one uh, to try out and it's you know it's, it, it's not you know it's it's a, it's a limited way to work but again, if you're going from nothing to a Chromebook, that's not a bad idea, right? And we want to have tablets, the, the tablet kind, so that, you know, it's as visual as possible. Um, so just curious on your thoughts about, about that, like with your program, like are you are you focusing on um, North America, like Europe, Africa, or like, the, like I'm curious to hear more, and I can go offline later and learn more, but um, I'm just curious on your feedback on that. I stepped in right when you were speaking and I already wrote some stuff down about Landano too. Um, okay, first, well, we want to go everywhere. Um, where where people want it, where it's needed. Um, we're starting in Canada because we're here. Um, oh, yeah. where, where are you, sir? I'm in Vancouver also. Hey, right on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm in, start... I'm in New Westminster right now. In where? On oh, New West? Yeah, I'm in uh, Port yeah. Portland. Sweet. We're neighbors. Okay, yeah. sorry, carry on. Um, no, that's cool. So our two first recipients, one was from India and one was actually a brother from Ghana, uh, Accra, Ghana. He's the founder of afro break a style of dance and we helped fund one of his seven country tours across africa where he also um set up a video a pre-recorded video to do to run some introductions on web3 and how people could use their art in web3 so cool. yes we would love to go there originally the goal was yeah. actually to go to africa and we were going to go to ghana because of our contact there but we decided to show our proof of work 
to go with the comedian Canada first and let people know what we can do here. Very cool. Okay. Um, well, we need to talk then. We'll, our team will be in Accra before the end of this calendar year. Wow. Okay. I'm going to definitely like, DM. Like my, myself personally and the management team. And then we're we're basically hiring locals to set up Landano Ghana as its own incorporated uh, oh. company. So that that's sense. all in the works. So there's a there's a trip being planned. Um, so we'll talk. Amazing. Cool. Yeah. Cool. That's what the space is for. I love the connection. Um, and we are right on time. Um, let me share the screen again really fast. And I want to thank everybody for your updates. This is part of what this is for, is to share what we're doing, to be able to connect um, and, and network and increase our impact by collaborating. Um, so yeah, so um, we just finished the intro, the community updates. We now have um, two segments, presentations, one from Joe Alam about regulation as code, I think. I got that right. And then Maddie Lohman about the socius impact lending. So um, Joe, you asked first. So I'm going to give you the floor first for this. Um, is 15 minutes good? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's more than enough. Sorry, my um, <laughs> one of my kids has just walked in and the dog's gone nuts. So I hope you didn't hear all of that barking <laughs> for a second. Um, Hi guys. Um, so this is about a project that we were funded for in Fund 8. Um, and it's a group of people here in uh, New Zealand who are currently calling themselves the Digital Aotearoa Collective. Aotearoa is the Indigenous name for New Zealand. And um, we were funded to put together a uh, rules as code project. So that's registration, um, regulations and legislation as um, code that's then consumable by both humans and by computers. So essentially the importance of this for the, for the um, distributed ledger technology space is in the back of all of those those wonderful dApps that you're creating, there is regulation regulation and legislation that needs to be complied with uh, from your jurisdiction. Um, and rather than going to, um, yeah, the screeds of PDFs and websites that currently um, house the legislation and and the regulations, which are most what most people refer to. Um, how could we turn those into code and create some kind of demonstration project um, that was based on the rules as code? So um, I'm going to drop into the chat a link. We're currently putting together our closeout video and slides which aren't quite ready I was hoping to have them ready for today but we haven't had them ready yet um but this link so benefitme.nz is a drupal website not a wordpress website we went with drupal because there's some work going on um down here as well um using that open source technology and it basically is a a demonstration of taking the rules and regulations around some of the social um, safety net rules and regulations that we have in New Zealand and coding them into the back end so that we can um, literally, our um, community can go here, um, put in their story um, as it relates to these spe specific regulations. So, you know, am I a a single mum with a kid who is looking for accommodation support. We have all of these wonderful um, social safety nets in New Zealand. I know everybody doesn't have those, but this is the laws that we picked and and um, chose to use for our demonstration. So you can go to this now. You can put in some details of, um, of yourself and find out, according to the law, uh, what you are entitled to. And this is important because often, uh, just like everybody else being disconnected from the regulations and the legislation, um, sometimes the people that are at the front desk um, and representing the government 
don't actually really know what's in the back end either, right? So they're working from formulas and rules of thumb often that they're using because they see so many clients and often people get denied things that they're actually uh, rightfully entitled to. So to complete this project, not only did we have a very cool group of, of people working on turning PDFs into code, uh, we also worked with the Citizens Advice Bureau and Community Law here in New Zealand, who are the people who everybody goes to once they've been denied something that they feel that they were entitled to. And those advocates are having to do that lookup of those PDFs as well. So now they have a tool which they can use instead of doing all of that work, essentially. Um, so the, the project was successful from, from that perspective. Um, we had a lot of learnings from it as well, though. So um, some of those learnings are uh, related to the nature of law. So these laws that we chose are very procedural. You know, you put an input in one end and you IO, you get an output out the other end. If you're this and this and this, you should be able to get this and this and this and this. A lot of the law is not so procedural, right? There is a lot of ambiguity and a lot of rights um, that can be, um, you know, applied and it's, it's more difficult to code that law. So we had a couple of conversations with people um, in uh, one of our team members had conversations with people in Colombia who are part of the um, Latin American town hall. Um, and they were looking um, for some help, having heard about our project, around some laws that were around their rights to uh, maintain indigenous forest and not have it um cut down essentially so there are um there are regulations in colombia around the rights of indigenous people and um to their to their land refers to your work again peter um and sometimes those rules are uh, are less easy to apply and they're not so procedural right um so yeah there are there are lots of open questions that have been created by this project. Um, another learning that we have is how hard it is to actually do this still at the moment. With the release of chat GPT, uh, potentially <laughs> this gets a little bit easier because you can actually set the robot on it. Um, but that also creates some issues in itself. So how do you know that the, that law, uh, that regulation has been interpreted uh, effectively into code uh, by the um, AI, by the machine? You know, like it, it's not entirely clear yet. And we're, you know, looking at that area now, how we're actually going to use chat GPT in this process. But what we have um, learned on the on the upside is how important this stuff is, right? So one project with one small piece of one legislation in one country was a project funded by Project Catalyst, um, and it took us the full six months to do it. Admittedly, not everybody is working full time on this, so there was a lot of volunteer um, hours applied to this, and it wasn't... Um, you know, a nine, not that anybody here works nine to five, but, you know, it wasn't a nine to five, five days a week kind of project. Everybody was um, contributing when they could, as they could. Um, some are side hustles, some as paid um, small projects, but there is a lot of work in it. So um, if we want a global financial operating system, we also need a global um rules-based repository, right? Um, which also can be validated in some way. And there's a hell of a lot of work in that. So we've got lots of directions, where to go next and, and what to look at next. Um, and we're looking for, um, you know, feedback and support and um, yeah, ideas really about what we, which direction we should take next. Um, have a look at Benefit Me. Um, there is another link here that I'm going to put into the chat, which is 
also the um, how to that we created, which was another deliverable um, from the project. Let me just find that link here. There you go. Um, our code base, um, all of this stuff will appear on our slide when we do our, our final um, report. Our code base is all open source. Um, we use an open source tool called OpenFisca, which was developed by the French that does some of the calculation pieces. Uh, there's access to that as well. It's an open source project. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we had um, another part of the project kind of join in, which was a, a Drupal based um, framework for governments to create their websites, uh, which makes it easier for public servants to actually do something that's kind of consistent <laughs> um, so that all of their websites don't look different. And ultimately, we're, we um, are hoping, working with Salsa Digital, who came on board with us, um, that all of those Drupal sites will have rules as code built into the back end of it when we develop our um, our way of funding this work, essentially, to make this happen. Um, so there's a bit of an outline. As I say, our, our final report is coming, um, but happy to take any questions or dig into any of those areas um, if anybody has um, any interest and, and questions they'd like to pose. Thanks, Jeff. That was super. Thank you. Can I, I have a question, Joe. Like, first of all, great work. I'm really interested in this project. I've been following you guys. And, um, sorry, the name escapes. Robert uh, obviously is, uh, is is he still involved as well? Or yeah. Um, yep, absolutely. Like, there's, there's quite a he's got quite an, a amazing, got an amazing <laughs> brain. That guy. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious, like, whether you guys consider it like a long term goal or a priority to actually make this a fully decentralized offering. Um, when I hear Drupal, it's like, you know, it's, uh, which is, you know, it does, it, it's good, it's good what, it, what it's good for. Um, like, so, especially when you talk about creating this registry of rules, like I would imagine, I would love to see that being a fully decentralized registry, right? And um, using something like IPFS or RWE for that kind of thing, right? And then you can add Absolutely. Little, uh, notarizations, you know, like little hashes on the block, on the ground blockchain. Is that, so that's part of the long-term strategy? It is, then, it is possible. It is because it's like I mean, I think the end goal should be if I know Robert and yourself like is that um, that should be accessible on chain smart contracts right without requiring a trusted third party to access those and if there's any changes and revisions to those over time that should also be tracked in an immutable log. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. So well, how well, far do well, you think? How far, how far, so what stage are you guys at now? If you put that into phases, what phase would you call this? Uh, and how what phase would that be? So that that's part of the um, the conversation at the moment is so this this group has come together as I say a lot of volunteer time as well as a few kind of you know few day projects to get it done um, for the project catalyst project and now really it's a it's a, a decision and a discussion about how we set this up as a not for profit as a foundation. Um, how we get uh, funding to do this work. It's really interesting that when you're talking about uh, turning rules into code, part of the part of the uh, thing that most people rely on that are doing work with laws is the ambiguity, right? So the fear of taking the ambiguity out and suddenly making it, you know, code that is, you know, immutable, um, you get a lot of pushback. So it's hard to get um, some people to think about funding something that is going to take away some of their wiggle room, right? Yeah, so this, this is, that's, yeah. I mean, this is one of those, uh, sorry, just to interrupt. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but um, uh, it's something we get with the land right records because like land rights change over time. Like somebody else might get the lease after five years, right? So like, well, it's, entities are immutable. So then, I mean, there's there's definitely design patterns around that we're seeing in our uh, system now. Like for example, we're implementing a dynamic NFT approach so just because a uh, and and versioning on an append only log is super fascinating and a problem that I'm solving with uh, with another development team for a project called Arkley, and but the, the point being is that just you know it's something for you to when you're pitching and talking to people it's like just yeah the record's immutable it doesn't mean you can't update it and you can't have a more updated version that refers back to the older version all of that's immutable that's a good thing that's what we want right but it doesn't mean that it's a one you, you better get the law right once and it's never going to change it that's just that's you know I, I think that's what you're running into maybe is that what you mean by that. Um, that's, that's part of it. 
the other part of it is a very human part of it you know there are there are funding decisions made about where to allocate resources for infrastructure right for the public service and at the moment those funding decisions are based on the collective of people that are working um in the public service right and um actually talking about something that's going to potentially automate some jobs and you know like actually getting an allocation for something that is going to be you know widely useful to the to the population is a political challenge right so there's the there's a technical challenge which is oh immutable can't go backwards as you've highlighted but there's the other challenge which is actually if we do this and we fund this it changes the nature of our organization or our ministry or our right. So, so I mean, we're running into a similar issue with Lando, Landano again, because for, for the longest time, everybody assumes you can do something about land records. You have to work directly with uh, government registries and, and the government itself that has the authority to register titles. And we have quite a different strategy now because it's a quasi legal space in Africa that gives uh, equal constitutional weight to the verbal commands of traditional leaders, chiefs, family plans, and so forth. And what we're coming in is doing formalizing those as proper records and then going back to government going, hey, we got better records than you. You want, you want some copies? And so, <laughs> and, and, right? And it's that's our strategy. And it, it, they're going to, they're going to, after a few years operating successfully in their country and seeing most of their citizens using it and, and demanding it, uh, it's, it's a simple matter of like going to the office side of the desk and turning it on for the government as well. So, and yeah. I'm confident saying that because I've been designing um, uh, enterprise systems for public sector for 20 years. And I know, I, I think you've got people like Pia Andrews and your team as well, right? Who has tons of yeah. experience in that sector. But so just to throw this out there, it's just, this is something like, like, do you really need government legitimacy? Like if the government issues a law, you don't need to, that's now law, it's published law. Like take it, do what you want with it and hold the government accountable to those laws. Like that, to me, that's Absolutely. more of a decentralized approach. It is, it is totally. The challenge is the funding, which I believe you probably had a conversation about before I um, before I arrived <laughs> today, right? Um, so you would think, right, making, making as, as Pia always says, right, government as a platform, what does that look like, right? And funding government as a platform, to, to create government as a platform, right, are different things. The, the ambition um, and as you know, Pia works incredibly hard all over the world on this, right? The ambition and, and buy-in from lots of public servants is there to do this work. The missing piece is actually funding the people to do it. And there are some very specialist, specialized skills, as you, as you know, in actually doing that work, um, which is, you know, like we, as I say, we were really lucky to get the team together that we were able to get together. Um, but in order to do the job properly, we need, to your point with Landana, you know, we need to get some seed funding, we need a proper plan, and we need to find people that are interested in um, funding this work and, and creating this global decentralized repository of jurisdictional law, right? That's, it's a, it's a huge project. It's not, a, it's not a small thing. So um, we're just starting that journey now. What does it look like? Who's in and who wants to take this on as, cause it's a, it's also a multi, multi, multi-year um, project. I love the, the think big behind all of that. Um, and, and we're going to have a little bit of time after this um, next presentation to open it up to further conversations on this topic or others. But I want to give Maddie some time. Um, and thank you, Joe, for, thank for you. regulation as code and providing the links. Super interesting. Uh, Maddie, do you want to take over and tell us a little about what Socius is up to? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nori, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for welcoming me into this space. I am Maddie. I am partnership lead uh, at Socius, and I'm joined by Sarah, whom I think many of you already know. And yes, Joe, I have a ton of questions, so I'm going to get through my idea, and it sounds like we have amazing ideas in this crowd already. Hopefully, we can tie some threads between um, what Sarah and I are working on at Socius and then what you all are also working on. I think for the next maybe 10 to 15 minutes, um, my plan is to provide a little bit more context on our project, and then I wanted to make this more interactive. I'm aware, even before you all shared, that we have a lot of wisdom 
in the room. So I have kind of like a virtual whiteboard um, and a couple of questions. If we could spend some time in dialogue around those. And then if it feels appropriate, I can bring up a few slides that further detail out um, our project under Fund 9. So by way of introduction, uh, I come from social entrepreneurship as my background. Um, I launched a small social enterprise when I was about 15, and it championed refugee youth um, on the border of Myanmar and Thailand that had a difficulty accessing all kinds of resources, one of those being legal support and another one being financial support. Um, and then in my journey in entrepreneurship and also Southeast Asia, turned over to the investment side and worked for a number of years on helping other, in this case, specifically women, um, scale their own social enterprises. And in that process, I came across a number of entrepreneurs that were subject to predatory lending uh, and struggled to access the financial capital that they needed to grow their businesses. You're probably well aware that only about 0.34% of all venture capital goes to women of color. Um, and I think, Sarav, a lot of what you mentioned before about color the blockchain, uh, not in terms of Web3, but just in terms of how colorism plays out in, in venture funding, um, might be something we want to connect on later and is a very real experience. So that was my background. And um, when Sarah presented the idea of, could we build a better way of lending and borrowing for financial inclusion and access to financial resources um, within the Cardano community, uh, I became really excited about that. So the project that we're working on, uh, this is funded under Catalyst Fund 9, is an impact investing or impact lending and borrowing platform um, that is established on a credit of social good, which I can detail out a little bit later, um, without the use of a financial intermediary. And we'll build this on what we're calling the Socius Impact Lending Platform. So I'll stop there for a minute. Um, I'm going to put a link, see if you can access this, in the chat. Let me know if you can edit this. Um, I, Because as I mentioned, I'm coming from thinking about how to apply some of the new technology that we are developing together to real world instances in which it can solve a need on the ground. Um, I wanted to pose to this group, what in your knowledge is the most applicable use case of blockchain in the real world? And maybe I can also share my screen so you can see this. Sure. And we don't we don't seem to have the permission access to get to that board. Ah, oh, you don't. Let me try this other link then. You need to do that anyone with a link from no access to edit. Um just in that right above the uh -huh. Yeah, that one. Now it should work, no? Yeah, well, it should work. Thank you. But while you're fiddling with that, um, to answer your question, I became chair of the Cardano Real High Consortium back at the Cardano Summit in Switzerland a few months ago. And the whole point is to like you know, build a collective of projects that are doing, using Cardano for real world utility. We're, we're going to have a website update after the weekend, and there'll be a, uh, all our member um, member website links will be there. So that'll you can just, I just posted the URL. So to answer that question, you'll be, there'll be a bunch of projects you can follow through and, and I'm sure there'll be some we haven't heard of yet that are essentially doing what you're asking. Amazing. That's wonderful. Okay, great. So if anyone else wants to throw in links, you can do that in the chat. You could also put them here. Um, I guess you can feel free to just say them as well. Um, and also add your own because many of you are working on obviously real world applications. So can I give us two minutes, maybe one minute, just to jot down some ideas and surface a number of projects worth looking into. Land right records. <laughs> yeah. I think I heard something about that one somewhere. And Laura's code. <laughs>
you could add algae token. <laughs> so I, really, I think, you know, maybe, maybe what I'm tripping up on, um, Matt, just some feedback is when you say the most applicable, right? Like to me, it's like, okay, which one is the most, like really, rather than like, what are some applicable use cases or like, what are some top applicable, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, when you say the most, it feels like, okay, yeah. there's only one. Hmm. So this is what I mean by most applicable. I mean, a case study that is able to achieve something unique specifically because of how it leverages blockchain technology that it would not otherwise achieve. And be as specific as you can, if you're able to, the name of the project or a link. There's like digital identity identifiers. I think, have you got that there? Um, All right, great. I didn't leave a ton of time for this in our discussion. So does anyone want to hop in and explain any one of these that you've put on? Um, I threw up a couple. Um, one was supply chain traceability and looking at how some projects, I think the Pond Foundation, and if I was trying to get the actual project name, um, are doing some stuff with BAM nut milk in Africa. and. Um, being able to trace the supply back as well as directly provide the proceeds back to the to the farmers using blockchain technologies. Um, and then the second sticky was just around self-sovereign identity. I think it was a huge deal that can't happen without blockchain. Um, and Proofspace, one of the projects that's working in that space. Um, and I'm super excited because they just announced a, a, uh, a Canvas plugin um, that enables you to complete Canvas courses and get um, SSI credentialing based on that. And that unlocks a whole set of... I think that's, I think that's okay. an underreported story. Pete, we need some more PR on that one because I think that's actually a huge breakthrough. Yeah, it's huge. So just to complete the circle, when I say land right records, what we're doing is we're tokenizing um, land as uh, NFTs because land is non-fungible and so that we avoid double spending issues um, and so blockchain is I ideal for that because um, again you create an immutable log uh, of, and registry it's essentially a type of a registry um, so blockchain is ideally suited for that problem I put um... that said I mean block I mean if you guys listen to that talk I was telling you about you know all we do is put hashes on the blockchain those hashes have to resolve in documents so documents better be online you better be able to prove those documents themselves or if they can have been tampered with you know the, the checksum gives you that there's a ton of metadata around context creation and use and so you basically end up having to design your own digital archive system again and then rather than do that from scratch we should be using existing standards and practices and so why not use rp.io which is what we're designing that to do so other digital projects don't have to do or we're making middle as an API but you're going to run into that problem with the supply chain thing you talked about there, Nori, as well, right? Like, so, um, you know, and that's, again, I think to me, that's a blind spot. A lot of people just, oh, we just throw this in the blockchain. We throw that in the blockchain. Blockchain's good for this. Blockchain's good for that. All we can do is put, like, either use, either move cryptocurrency around or put hashes and documents on the blockchain. That's it. It's a glorified timestamp, right? And I, I think we've got way too much hyperbole around this um, that uh, people aren't addressing and doing good engineering around. So I just want to, I just want to be the, the party group here and just say that as well. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I was I was gonna say um I added the proof of impact. I don't know if it makes sense, but I think it does. So I put proof of impact. It was from a conversation we had during the other call I had last week actually with Cardano for Climate, and someone brought it up. I wish I remember who. Um, so it's like when you have proof of impact. Proof of impact meaning when you're giving people computers you know, or when you're going into a community and you're doing something, you're using these funds, you're doing something, the proof of how the money got there and then what happened after. But, you know what I mean? Kind of having a database for it. 
Yeah, so absolutely. And that actually ties into both socius and therefore my next question. Um, so for context, at socius, we might take that same idea, proof of impact, and say that when you do such donation, lend money, lend computers, anything on the platform, you receive tokens, you receive points for it. And the more points that you have, that is an indicator of the more positive contribution that you're giving to some cause or back to society. And then you can leverage those points for something else, right? That's the basic principle, but it's also transparent, traceable, et cetera. So it makes people want to trust the system and each other a little bit more. Um, so now switching over to lending, given the choice to lend money through traditional means or via crypto, what would compel you to lend through a blockchain powered peer to peer lending platform? Obviously we've just named a couple of reasons, but I think there will be more that might come out of this group. Well, in our case, it's actually providing financing and lending to people who've never had access to it in their entire lives, going generations back. So people are locked out of the financial system due to core issues, one of them being not having land tenure records for land they legitimately own. And then if you do manage to make it as far and qualify for a mortgage in a place like Mozambique, they're going to charge you 30%. Like it's just outrageous, right? So um, there's a huge, un like, yeah, banking unbanked or financing the undocumented. Like, um, so, and we hope that we can present that to our users to say, look, we've, we've brought all these people on chain and, and we've created standards compliant, trustworthy land right records for them. And now we want to lend them money so they can buy a tractor or borrow seeds or build a barn and essentially uh, open up a microfinancing platform for that and, and bringing in other DeFi lenders to provide that uh, liquidity. Um, so to me, like that's the most compelling argument right there for why I myself sitting here in Vancouver, I might say, oh, you know, if I wasn't the Landano founder, but I found out about that project and go, it's similar to Kiva. It's like, okay, I'll put a thousand bucks down and I know I'm getting it four or 5% back. Um, and I know it's going to people that have never had access to financing before. Yeah. Peter, how do you choose the geography to do this? In? You've chosen yeah, so, we, in, mm -hmm. so we deliberately chose Ghana because we feel there's a number of factors that make it right for our work. Um, it's actually a fairly advanced sub-Saharan African economy, but it's totally crippled by its land right problems. So it's, you know, it's fairly digital. Um, it's fairly forward thinking. It's real, it's pretty democratic. There's, there's lots of other you know, issues you see in lots of places, but um, in general, like it's a country that's ripe for, um, it's just stuck. And so they're actually desperate for a solution. And, and, but then first and foremost, they have the, uh, the Ghana Lands Act that's passed in 2020, which basically um, enshrines the, the power of traditional chiefs to manage land um, and recognizes their you know, intergenerational authority to do that. And so the only thing that's missing is they don't have a record keeping system. So we're going to help them leapfrog that and give them a system that they can use. So that's why we chose Ghana, because it was like, for us, it's like, A, we want to do something in Africa, and B, um, we wanted to have a low-hanging fruit country. And then Mozambique's the opposite. Mozambique's a real challenge. And uh, Mozambique, um, so essentially, I mean, like the Ghanaian president was on TV two weeks ago, basically begging companies to come in and help solve this problem. Um, and so, you know, part of the Ghana Land Act basically has just you know, talking about rules, rule, rule of law, Joe, we're like, we're taking like the Ghana Land Act and we're turning with the system requirements. So very similar to what you're doing, essentially, we're probably going on the same path. Um, and, but I've got various software engineering techniques and methodologies that we're trying to implement that use the previous projects to do that. Um, but in, in Mozambique, um, the, so anyway, so Ghana is like saying, Ghana is like ready for this and ready for us. And our pilot project this past year has essentially proven that there is huge pent up demand. Um, and, but in Mozambique, it's like the opposite. So like, okay, let's pick a country where this is challenging. Um, and so we were very fortunate to work with um, some land right activists on the ground in Mozambique. We've actually been working for the last four or five years helping um, build, the, the, in Mozambique has the same in their constitution. It recognizes the authority of village chiefs to make land allocation decisions. Um, but again, they don't have a system. So this are our partners in Mozambique who are also friends of Empower, the people are doing mortgage lending in Mozambique, um, have gone in the last four or five years to various townships and helping them essentially interpret the, have interpreted the constitution and have like a turnkey solution to like 
turn those villages into formerly land associations, which is kind of the hoops you have to jump through to make a legitimate Mozambique. And then they've helped them, again, most of the population's illiterate, so what they end up doing is creating laminated maps with like land rights and in the Mozambican situation to have the names of witnesses, all that stuff's on there. But now they're like, and they have a digital database for this, but now they wanted to say, okay, the next step is to get the stuff connected to a blockchain-based platforms because they, all their users want to get access to DeFi lending as well. But this this team and this, this project and this whole approach is very controversial in Mozambique, whether it's more of a, let's say, an anti, not as democratic, and there is a cabal that runs the country, including surveyors and property rights owners. So in a country of 32 million people, there's only 600 registered mortgages in Mozambique, for example. And so our partners on the ground there are getting pushed back. So this is, so we have one, we're like, okay, this is a place where we think we'll be welcome. And here's a place where we know we're not welcome. And so we deliberately chose the two so that we can basically, you know, figure out where to see the challenges on both sides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That really resonates. Um, it really resonates. I can share maybe in three minutes how we've approached some of these same challenges um, with the project that we're working on. So I think when the number of variables that could prohibit success in this project stack up, um, we have to figure out <laughs> how to choose to tackle just a couple at a time. So for, for Socius and our lending platform, I'll play this for you. Hmm. Yeah, I'll play this for you. I'll do it from here. Um, what we have started with so far is the base problem, as we've more or less identified already, that almost a quarter of the world's population still have limited access to financial resources and are unbanked, um, and that it's incredibly hard, therefore, to establish credit, and that even where microfinance institutions can serve these populations, they charge really high interest rates on their loans. And of course, the idea is that accessing financial services is essential to break the cycle of poverty. And so what we proposed in Fund 9 is this impact lending platform, which is a decentralized protocol that allows people to lend and borrow thanks, which will be Socius's native tokens, without having to go through a centralized intermediary, as I've mentioned. The rest of this, I, I kind of want to skip through because, as you can see, we're still at milestone one, now two, um, of this project. And so many of these details will um, come through in our final report. But I think we also looked to your point, Peter, about you know where, where is the opportunity right? We looked at what are the countries with the most unbanked populations in the world. Um, and then I have conducted kind of interviews within several of these areas. So for example, Ecuador, we have some context there. We have some context in the Philippines. Um, as well as Tanzania, so these heavily unbanked areas, and gathered some really good insights from those problems or from those situations. Um, it kind of came to the conclusion that while we want to think big, of course, we're going to start really small with this particular pilot, uh, and that naturally robust stakeholder coordination is key, and we will build trust in the process, and that, of course, is not new to this crowd. Um, so some of those criteria that you've mentioned that others have brought up would be that we want a population to work with us in this pilot that is literate, um, that may not be banked, but they probably own a smartphone or know how to use it, have some cellular network, and are familiar somewhat with the digital space. And then to the point that was made earlier about you know finding computers for different um, circles, sort of, I think we also want for sure this population to be self-selected. So they want access to financial resources that they're not having right now. Whereas we don't want to impose you know, a solution on that. So that is all to say we've identified some major um, groups and stakeholders that could be a part of our pilot. Those were farmers, refugees, or internally displaced persons. There's a project out of the UNHCR and Stellar Aid Assist that works with displaced um, Ukrainians from the Ukraine-Russian war. That's pretty neat, but it's a one-way cash flow. So it's cash-based assistance, not lending. Um, also students, and then even Cardano entrepreneurs, which is maybe a separate topic that has also been explored by another um, team in the community. 
And so out of this, where we've landed now is that we would like to start, we will start with um, youth and young adults that are transitioning out of care homes. Um, so don't have parents or guardians or networks to rely on for some of that financial education um, and are looking to open bank accounts to establish themselves to start to earn an income. And it's right at that point that if they don't have that kind of resource or access to financial resources, many of them fall into cycles of poverty. So we're trying to prevent that um, with this lending platform. And the idea there is that they can earn credit to their point where they wouldn't have it otherwise by contributing positively to their society in the process and then receive loans. For example, they could receive a loan to then upscale themselves, maybe to take a training course, maybe to land a job, right? And pay that back through the platform. So lots to be built out in terms of the platform there, but this is where we're headed. Um, and I'm happy to take questions on any of these details. I think I'll stop here because we've been chatting for a while. I don't, I don't have a question. I just think it's really, I love, I love what I'm reading so far and now I'm just soaking it in. I'm just going to keep listening and researching more, but I love it. And I'd love to build with you when there's some time. I also sent you a, a DM. Thank you. Likewise. I love to hear about what you're doing. So likewise. Okay. Peter, you have a question? Yeah, so likewise, I, this is wonderful. I love hearing uh, about projects like this. Um, and um, so I, to, I mentioned it before, but I think your project would actually benefit from joining the Realify Consortium. So, and joining is not is really simple. You just join our Discord server and you can hang on to business meeting every couple of weeks if you want. But because um, I mean, one thing you're going to run into right off the bat, which most Realify projects, so again, by Realify, we're talking about projects that are connecting the real world assets and business processes to Cardano based blockchain transactions and assets, right? So that's what we're doing by Realify. And that may or may not have social impact or DeFi or uh, SSI, but many of them do. So, um, and so we have a working group on, on the ground already, and we're already uh, reaching out to. So, because the thing you got to run into is like crypto to fiat conversion, right? Like, so your users um, are going to need to have, and in most of the cases, like for us in Africa, that means mobile pay. So it means like crypto to not crypto to cash; it's crypto to like mobile pay. And so we've got a working group on the ground already, and we've got a great team working on that already. And just so they're, you know, we've got like um, a research report out already. We're creating a Twitter space. We're inviting uh, Koti, uh, sorry, Kutani is one of the leading kind of mobile pay providers. Um, so, I mean, I, I think you'd benefit a lot from just hanging out with this group because you're going to hear a lot of the same things that you're trying to do, other people are already doing. And the whole point is we're helping each other, like, you know, um, rising tide raises all boats, right? So. We're working as a, we want Cardano to be the go-to blockchain for social impact. And that's why we work, came together like this. And it's, it's a, it turned out to be just like, you know, like so many Cardano communities, it's just a great group of people. Like, um, and then secondly, I have a question is why are you deciding to make your own token? Uh, why don't you just use ADA? Yeah, thank you for the comment and great question. And actually I'm gonna let Sarah answer that one if you would like to Sarah. Hi, hi, Peter. Long time no see. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. So, I guess um, yeah, there there are a few considerations that we had like when we decided to launch our own tokens. So one way is to do it like I guess Milko Meta. Milko Meta doesn't have their own tokens, and then they just use some uh, ADA or like wrapped ADA for their transactions, and uh, for for us, we wanted to um, create our own community of uh, social impact um, enthusiasts, and, and for that, we wanted to have like incentive mechanisms for our uh, community members, and uh, we felt that um, the purpose of Ada as a platform and the purpose of Socials as a platform on top of Cardano. Or Milko Meta, it's I thought the the purpose of it was different, and all the uh, flexibility that comes with having our own tokens as well. So, yeah, we we thought that it's um 
Oh, uh, it's is that a utility function. Like you can only pay and interact because of that coin. Is it? Is it really? Is it? A, you're looking at it as a long-term way to raise money. Um, because I, I'll tell you right off the bat, like doing tokenomics right is is really difficult, and it's a good way to shoot yourself in the foot uh, before you even get off the ground. So um, be very careful about that. And again, we discussed this stuff in real life and sorting, right? For the Orcfax project, we're doing that right now. And you wouldn't believe the amount of legalities I'm jumping through. I've got incorporate anyway. So I can talk to you offline about it if you like, but just be very careful. And and Thank and you. also now in these days as well, in the Kodama community, like you have to be very careful about your public image and reputation that you aren't seem to be taking a cash grab. You're issuing a token just so you can cash in on it. You have to be very, I, I know you guys have you got your heart in the right place, but I'm just giving those feedback, right? It's, it's, it's really brutal out there right now. So you got to be careful. And I, I want you guys to succeed. So, um, and in our case, for example, for Landano, for those reasons and others, we are not issuing our own Landano token. And we are simply charging ADA, um, using ADA uh, to, on our platform and, and taking a commission, like taking like a four or 5%, 2%, whatever, right? Whatever we end up doing of that ADA. And that's how we can fund ourselves. And then the lastly, the trick is going to be you're dealing with a population that's very technically illiterate. So to add yet the burden of them having to convert from ADA to your token back to ADA back to some other thing, you're just added to the complexity of the platform and potentially you're going to lose users because of the usability issue. So that's just some friendly feedback. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I have a question for you though. Uh, so yeah, th that's really great feedback. But so we, we want to be decentralized autonomous organization at some point. So we, we want to use thank tokens as uh, governance tokens as well. So in that case, um, I guess if we don't have our own tokens, then if ADA holders vote, then I think that will be, that will change the dynamics of the community on, on socials. So like, how would you build a decentralized autonomous organization with like voting rights without having your own tokens? Uh, yeah, there's many ways to do it. You, you don't have to have state-based voting. It's not the only way to run a DAO. But like, I mean, there's legitimate reasons to have a token for governance. I get it. But um, I strongly encourage you to like reach out to somebody that has some tokenomics expertise to get some advice because I think you guys are, I want you to succeed. And right now, this to me, this is your Achilles heel. So, um, uh, you know, like you need to, you need to go deeper on this. And I would recommend somebody like, um, we're working directly with Simon Peters from Zerberos. Um, and he's too busy now, like, um, but um, there's there's other people in the community that basically they, they, they make themselves available as consultants to help you analyze your tokenomics. So um, I would encourage you to, because if I was if I was sitting, if you're pitching to me right now and that was your answer, you I can tell that you haven't thought through the, the, all the consequences to the end. And that's just, again, I'm just, I want your project to succeed. I'm just giving you some tough love. I can also- Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so ahead. Peter, would you would you mind going just a little list for everybody present the kinds of challenges, right? So it's it's regulatory challenges and um it's it's dealing with financial services and it, like uh, you give you give the list. <laughs> yeah, well kind... once again, I don't want to dominate the conversation. So maybe else has anything to add to that first. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna I can connect you with uh someone we've met through Cardano for Climate that has written over a hundred tokenomics white papers for different groups. So she's really knowledgeable in this space and can give you a lot of pointers at least. So um, that'll be I, amazing. I'm Thank happy you. To connect to you. Yeah. Appreciate it. To answer his Joe question, like I don't want the SEC to come knock on my door and throw me in jail because we screwed something up with their token, right? Like, oh, this utility token is actually security and you uh, violate all these security regulations and now come with us. Um, that, that's pretty much 90% of founders fear. Um, and um, again, it's a huge blind spot, like projects haven't thought through that properly. And there's a lot of projects in our space that have issued tokens before they even had a product because they wanted to cash grab and a lot of shit coins floating around and it's gonna bite a few of them in the ass. So um, the way we're doing is we're working with a Liechtenstein registered company that uh, Liechtenstein has very friendly cryptocurrency laws. They've um, defined very clearly what is a security token, what's a utility token. And we're working with a firm that has all the security regulations licensing. So they will actually do the Genesis Mint of the Orcfax token. And so that it's, and then they can offer that as a service to us as a company. And the company itself is registered in the British Virgin Islands, where again, it has very friendly cryptocurrency laws. 
um, lots of flexibility around like, you know, um, accepting what, you know, what is a token? What does it do? It, essentially dig digital assets laws. So once the tokens are minted in Liechtenstein, they will be transferred to Just went off. Yeah, I'm not sure what just happened. Everybody got muted somehow. Um, um, it's the SEC, they're spying. <laughs> okay. um, um, right, so then, um, and then that entity, now that the, the tokens have been minted, is in charge of the distribution because again, it's doing from a jurisdiction that has clear laws on how you, what you can or can't do with digital assets. Um, and I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the short version of the whole story. Um, and then there's again, like the actual tokenomics as far as like how much tokens we're issuing, um, how much of the token pie is allocated to what, um, when those tokens vest, um, and having clear visibility around that, which is again, is something that's desperately needed, not just in Cardano, but in the space as a whole. That's all things we're trying to model as good practice for our project and others. Um, the Orcfax um, ISPO prospectus in the white paper will all be published within the next month. So all of, all the, all those kind of like uh, nitty gritty details will be in that. So follow the Orcfax Twitter account if you want to stay up to date on that stuff. Amazing. That'll be really valuable information for much of the community. Joe, did you want to say something? You're muted. So then there's all the all the fraud and security and all of those pieces um, that come into all of that compliance um, stuff that you need to do. And um, like we get a few entrepreneurs here in New Zealand that go, oh, that's America, you know, that's the SEC in America. And it's, it's all that. They're all connected through FATFA, <laughs> all of um, the organizations. Yes. I'm pretty sure New Zealand has that extradition uh, agreement with uh, the US just like Canada does. Honestly, this is like, and so, I mean, um, and that's why an ICO is kind of cool in a way because what you can, because the problem is once you do an ICO, international coin offering, um, you have to jump through all these hoops in KYC to make sure the people you're selling to are in the U.S. Nobody dares sell a coin. Don't even think about selling a coin, no matter what, no matter how utility you think it is. But it doesn't matter because the SEC is like, this is security. Your child's birthday present is security. Those baseball, that baseball card, like, it's, everything is security, right? So it's like, fuck that one. So, um, um, so uh, yeah, check if your country has an extradition out of the U.S. because they'll come knocking eventually. Yeah. Right. It's just so much extra overhead, right? For an entrepreneur, it feels like. It is, and that's, sudden, again, that's why we created the RealFi Consortium because we all share these problems and we're all exactly. collaborating and sharing knowledge there just like this, right? The projects that are at these, at the, just like your projects are now launching and getting ready. And these are, we're like, I have this problem, I have this problem. So I just, you know, keep talking to people. We're all sharing the same problem rather than just doing it in a group like this or, you know, having a whole conversation at a conference. And like, we should just form a consortium and do it on a Discord channel. So that's what we've been doing. Very cool. Amazing. Yeah, thanks everybody for sharing. And thanks Joe and Maddie for your presentations. That was great. Um, so we have 15 minutes left. We can open it up to general conversation, questions, follow-ups on anything that was presented. Um, I'm super happy with all the networking and connections that are happening tonight. Um, it seemed like a really great crowd to gather for the topics that were talked about. So yeah, um, I'm super appreciative of everybody being here. And Peter, uh, Miguel had a question for you in chat, it sounds like. Um, I don't know if Miguel- Yeah, I, 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 just, I just saw that. No, the people that we're working with um, are under contract and they would not come to their space. They're, they're expensive lawyers and legal experts. We can't afford them. But yes, yet we pay because I don't want to get crushed into a U.S. jail. Ultimately, we're still so early in this space, right? So eventually, all of these laws will be code, <laughs> and there will be a there will be a process to follow 
which you're able to follow, which um, won't include the use of, you know, five hundred dollar an hour lawyers um, in order to get this stuff approved. You know, to get get the um, the authority to issue to um, get your tokens verified. You know, all of those pieces. So we're literally flying. You know, we're flying the plane while we're still building the wings, guys. <laughs> right now so don't be disheartened it's not that you're doing anything wrong it's just that we're we're yeah. literally co-creating totally and thanks for bringing it back down there that's totally right I'm, I'm really tired today so i don't mean to sound like a like a like a, like a wet blanket i'm just you know, just rattling off what I, what I know um but at the end of the day i'm here because i believe this is possible and i want this to work and i want all of our projects to succeed right and that's um and and they will we're gonna do it like and you know joe's totally right we're we're building the plane as we're flying it and like but you know that's what gets me up in the morning that's why i i, I jumped into web3 full-time a year ago because i couldn't stop thinking about this stuff and wanting to work on this stuff right and, and again catalyst gave me that opportunity catalyst gave me the launching pad so i'm super grateful yeah yeah and even the it's not even wet blanket stuff and honestly like being very blatant sometimes is very important and it's just at the end of the day, it's we have to be very blatant with each other, you know, while we're being kind um, and while we're being blatant and kind. We may not always even agree with the other person's perspective. However, it's important for us to see it because we're all we're all buildings like everything I'm hearing here is so amazing. I'm super charged up every time I'm in a Cardano space. I'm charged up. Honestly, like I I feel like I belong in the world again, to be honest. And um it's really cool that it's like a puzzle we're like a big puzzle we have to kind of be honest with each other because our pieces are touching and they need to be touching and they need to connect to make it all work like we're bringing people computers but people can't it's hard for someone to learn on an empty stomach it's hard for someone to learn when they don't have housing it's hard for someone to learn when they have no electricity they have a kind of computer you know what about the internet what about uh, domestic violence and issues that they're facing? What about mental health issues and lack of access to a resource that help that? So it's like this puzzle, we're all a piece of it. So I, I, I love hearing all of it, you know? Absolutely. Right there with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Matt, Matt, Corbett, Corbett, thank you. <laughs> Um, if any, if nobody else has got a question, I've I've got another question for um Peter, and then and also maybe Dylan as well, because I know you've you've ventured into this space. Just your um your thoughts on dealing with um venture capitalists <laughs> on VCs and their current well, in your experience and the people that you've spoken with, um. For everybody else here present who's got um projects that they are looking for funding what is the yeah what's the feedback that you have um from dealing with vcs well it's not the best time to go looking for vc funding right now it's the bear market and you know we had all this kind of bad news around crypto last little while so a lot of them are gun shy um but my take on so far, like we're, we're really only just started the last couple of weeks to take this seriously. Uh, we joined the accelerating program a month ago. Um, and then I shook a bunch of VC hands in, in Miami and there's, yeah, there's, you know, for me, it's very important that we find the right match for Landana. We just want, we don't, we can do this. We'll do it one day way or another, but I don't want to go into bed with the VC that's just looking for a quick exit and thinks uh, we want to, we, and there's lots of ESG social impact investors out there. Like we're, Today, we had a couple of management team meetings where we, we got an introduction to two of those. And so for us, you know, it's important that we find an investor that matches our values and our mission and believes in it. And, you know, and yes, it's it's a money making opportunity too. great. Right? Like that's that's, you know, this is, this is part of the kind of thing that's cool about blockchain. It actually recognizes that people have financial incentives because like Surat said, like, you know, you got to need money to like to get um mental health counseling to get like to buy food to like pay for electricity like you know it's just that's just the, the in the modern world that's the utility that we have that that's the thing that we use and of course money is broken and um the system is totally broken and that's why we're going to improve it with crypto but like um 
you know, the, 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 we need money. So money is just like the, you know, the water that flows the pipes. Um, and, but to me, it's an end to the means. It's not, you know, if, as long as I can feed my kids and keep a house, keep a roof over their heads and, and do stuff that I enjoy. Great. Right. And if I happen to make some money, I can buy a boat so I can sail over to Nori. That would be even more fun. So, um, but you know, that's not, that would just be gravy. So, but anyway, so um, yeah, I, I say, be careful. Like be careful who you get into bed to. Like you can get desperate, right? You can get to the point where you just feel like, you know, that, you know, this is your only option. Like fine, this, 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 um, you know, but I don't, I think you need to be patient um, and find the right match. Now it's easy for me to say that. What if, what if we're six months down the road right now, we still haven't found a VC, you know, maybe I'll change that, that tune. Right. But um, that's my feeling right now. And yeah, I, I, there's, there's lots of social impact investors out there and um, guys like Yoram and um, you know, his and, and Harry Hellier who we've actually been getting business coaching from um, they're connected to that world. And so take, like lean on those guys and ask them to for introductions to that kind of thing. Like, and again, that's the kind of thing we are starting to discuss in the real fight consorting as well. And again, you guys, Joe, you guys belong there as well. Hmm. Dylan or Sarah, I know both of you are funded yeah. to the same impact fund. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thoughts on VC, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one because, um, Yet again, I mean, Peter made many, many excellent points there that I, I definitely agree with everything he said that you have to be careful who you're with. Um, we have, um, we're looking for possible VC funding, but at the same time, we want to make sure it's the right people. We're not, as, as you said, like not looking for a cash grab. Our VCs can bring like really valuable experience, but they have networks, resources, They've got legal contacts. They've got the ability to, to network and they can play a really significant role in shaping your business. So they do have some advantages there as well. Um, doing algae projects that are off blockchain for years, we've dealt with many VCs and seen what can happen. With this project, um, it is possible that we'd be looking for VC sort of seed import but primarily we would love the community to all have like fractional shares in this especially if it's asset token with bringing to a real a real life real five project um that's that's the advantages of blockchain there that way you have a sparse amount of members that all have input sort of staking and they have their interests in it and they want to see it i mean being a social impact highly ESG project as well helps when looking for uh, that sort of VC. Um, but it's something that we, we, we definitely haven't rushed into. We, we're not rushing into anything due to the fact that we want to do everything right. Um, the, the legals, this regulations, the jurisdictions, everything involved have been by far the biggest hurdle in getting a real fire project onto the blockchain. Uh, we could have rushed through things, but we want to make sure that this is a, a longevity. We want the long-term goal, not the short term. We're not, we're not chasing that quick dollar. We're, we're chasing the benefits of a, a, a system that works. So that's why I'm also looking at systems that can be open source and help everyone. If, if we can, and through the real fire. So I, talk, I talked to Peter about this and I'll probably propose something to the group uh, at the next meeting about a system that can help everyone sort of on board with the right jurisdiction and regulations uh, and the right pathway to follow. But I mean, I've, I've got off topic. The VC this route, it can work. It can't. It's not a great time. It's not a great time for anything in the markets anywhere. But at the same time, it could really offer the opportunity for a project to kick off and start and, and get those wheels running. So um yeah it's it's a conflicting a conflicting thoughts on my behalf i see the benefits and the and the uh, negatives but um it's going to be up to individuals projects to decide and the teams yeah, behind them thanks Dylan. thank you that's awesome it's good to have um as, i don't know if anybody else in the room has experience of angels or vcs and wants to chip in something else sarah do you have anything to contribute in that space 
So my perspective is that um, I guess what uh, I totally agree with uh, what Peter Dylan said that I think um, we should be perfectly aligned on the mission before you take the money or like you. I think it's a partnership collaboration, and um, it's not just money. They they bring in different resources like maybe industry knowledge or network and uh, I think I, I value more more than the money part but the mission fit and also you know non-financial resources that they, they bring that's kind of my perspective awesome so my my 10 cents worth is um oh sorry Steve go I thanks um you know, when I'm, I've had some conversations with some people involved with impact investors, and one of the things I'm always curious about, particularly in the Cardano space, is I never hear what they want besides, you know, the, the larger goal of making an impact. And I feel like with Cardano, you know, buying ADA and staking it to a stake pool and those that's operating out of those regions of the world where they want to have an impact seems to me to be the, the largest impact they could have. And if you combine that with solid tokenomics, right? You know, I mean, Cardano is meant to be a, a, a fractal growth kind of system, you know? And so, you know, in the work that I do with Gimbal Labs and with WADA, I'm really trying to talk to them about thinking about tokenomics by creating their own commodity to re represent the value that they already have and the value that they'll create in the future. So then you've got commodities created in these communities that belong completely to them and they're running on the backbone of a system that, that runs through the function of the commodity that ADA is. You know, and ADA is meant to secure the protocol and I believe now with you know, the growth that we're seeing and are going to continue to see with stable coins, this is how people can, you know, kind of spin that value that they've created when they need to. But the whole thing works best when that value is securing itself. And I mean, this used to be the way banks worked back in the old days. You know, and so I, Again, I just to come swing back around to VC talk. I don't, I don't. I'm not. I'm not the kind of guy these guys want to talk to. But this is the question I would be asking these guys. I mean, what do you really want for your money, as an investor? You know, you want something. You know, beyond the impact that the proper investment could, can make. Um, I, and I just think that we have a. We have a sales pitch in the Cardano ecosystem that's that's not really utilized optimally so far anyway. That's all. So I didn't really have a question. It was just kind of my thoughts about it. Thanks, Steve. And um, that brings us right to the end of the 90-minute segment. So I want to make sure that we're kind to our YouTube viewers. And I'm going to stop the recording here. But I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming and sharing and being in this space. I think we created a little bit of magic here and made some connections. And yeah, so I appreciate everybody. Thank you very much. Um, and bye-bye, YouTube.